Um, I'd like now to introduce our final speaker for this session before we start our panel discussion, uh, Sue McCarricker. Sue has been Chief Executive Officer of the Australian <coughs> Library and Information Association since 2012. And before that, she was director of the team that developed, that delivered the National Year of Reading in 2012. And I loved that year. That was a great year. Prior to this, Sue has worked with state libraries, public libraries, local councils, not-for-profits, a publishing house, and a university. Uh, through her work in the UK, she was involved with the Museums, Libraries and Archives Council, as well as the British Library. Please welcome Sue. Well, thank you very much, Louise. And um, if I pause at any point in this presentation, it's not that I've forgotten what I was going to say, it's just that I'm buffering. <laughs> okay. and, and I have to say, um, Co Colin's presentation was well worth watching a second time. I'd forgotten how entertaining and thoughtful he was, so that was just great. Well worth it. Um, so, thank you and good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to be here today and talking about digital citizenship. Um, I have... Sorry, I just want to make sure this works. No? OK, Adam, how do I move this forward? Ah, there we go. Um, I have recently been very thoughtful about the subject of citizenship because I am just going for Australian citizenship. And on the 31st of March, I'm going to stand up, put my hand in the air, and make the pledge and then I will be an Australian citizen. Yay! Um, but it made me think about citizenship. And actually, um, what they tell you about citizenship is that it gives you the opportunity to fully participate in building our democratic nation. It means that you're ready to fulfil your responsibilities and that it's about living the values that make Australia great in your everyday life. And when we were in Wellington, one of the questions that came in the panel discussion, which took me a bit by surprise, was when somebody said, what is digital citizenship? And, and there we were talking about it, but actually, how do you define it? And I think it caught everybody in the panel a little on the hop. And my rather inadequate answer was, well, it's being safe and confident online. But I looked at this definition of citizenship that, that kind of came out of the ordinary, kind of everyday, real world. And then I thought about it in relation to digital citizenship. And I thought, actually, it's the same thing. It's actually about saying we want people to participate fully in creating this de democratic environment. We want people to have responsibilities. And uh, Alistair spoke very eloquently about the responsibilities we all have to behave well online. And it's also about living the values that we share um, and being respectful online and not doing those things, again, that Alistair mentioned earlier. So, so I think my thing about digital citizenship is actually, it's like real world citizenship. We all want to behave well, live well together uh, and make a difference. So, so I looked at the title of this originally and I thought, well, democracy is about social equity. And then I looked up social equity because I didn't know what that meant. And it's the absence of systemic disparities is the, is the definition. So what it actually comes down to is, is, are we equitable? Is digital citizenship equitable? And actually, no, because digital access in Australia is far from equitable. So the digital divide, one in five Australians is not online. These are figures from Telstra, and they should know. Um, four in ten of the lowest income households in Australia are not connected to the internet. These are current figures. It's so easy, isn't it? When we're all sitting here, there are so many iPads out there. We're all very easily connected at home, at school, in the office. But, but actually, four in ten of the lowest income households are not connected. What does that look like? What is life like? And then, of people aged 65 years or more, only 46% are internet users and 75% are confused. And I'm just going to end the sentence there. They're just confused. <laughs> um, so, so actually, we've got a whole group of people who are not engaged, not online. It's not equitable. So what does that mean? Well, with no internet access at home, kids doing homework can't. 
because we all know, we, those of us who have kids, that actually you can't do your homework without the internet. And uh, Jane Cowell, who's in the audience today from the State Library of Queensland, said to me, what kid do you know who does their homework at 4.30 in the afternoon, ready, well, probably with two days' notice of the deadline? No, no, it's 9 o'clock that night, 10 o'clock that night, saying, I've forgotten to do that. So there's nowhere open that they can dash off to to do their homework. Job seekers can't find and apply for jobs online. And um, I think it was Alex who said about um, fast food places, the, the supermarkets who require you now to apply for jobs online. And then we have 1.6 million seniors who can't take advantage of things like online banking, um, ordering your groceries online if you're housebound, um, making bill payments, uh, Skyping your relatives, doing nice things online. These are all things that are blocked to citizens. So are we a, a democracy in that sense? Do we have social equity? No, we don't. Not online. And even more disturbing is that people with profound or severe disability who need assistance with core activities have significantly lower access to broadband and the internet than other Australians. And there's lots of work happening to try and address this, but actually that is the situation today. Um, one of the things that was said in the Northern Territory um, by the Northern Territory Library was that actually the people who need it most, remote indigenous communities, are actually the most poorly served. And that kind of rolls out across the whole of the country, but, but that's the key, isn't it? The people who need it most are the people who have least access. So, what does digital inclusion in the library context look like at the moment? And I've kind of put six things here. The first is that we offer support for cyber safe online experiences. Um, and that is uh, a role that we have had to develop over the last five years. Um, it's something that we've had to make sure that our library staff are comfortable with. And, and that is one element of, of the thing that we're doing. The second is that we're actually offering the high-speed broadband internet access in a safe, friendly community space. And we've got the stuff, we've got the devices, we've got the PC terminals, we've got the tablets, we've got the e-readers, we've got the wikis, uh, the Wi-Fi's and the wikis. Um, if you've gone to the wonderful library um, at Docklands in Melbourne, which Paula Kelly, who, who launched it, is in the audience today, um, you'll find there's a dispensing machine with tablets to be dispensed. I mean, how exciting is that? You just dispense yourself an iPad. Um, but we are delivering those devices. We're also offering spaces for exploring innovative digital technologies, places like the Imaginarium in New South Wales. We've got some amazing uh, media labs around the place. We've got both necessary and engaging content. Necessary content in terms of um, you know, small businesses coming in and saying, actually, I need market research, and us saying, yes, actually, we've got some databases that will give you some advice about the market for your new product. We've also got engaging content. We've got Trove. We have many other things, but we have Trove, which is wonderful and engaging. Um, and we have the training and informal help for people to develop their, in, their literacy skills, their digital literacy skills. Now, everybody's wondering why I haven't mentioned particular programs. But the reason is the next slide. I wanted to talk about what is going well. Now, we've got the eSmart program, so we've got the Alana and Madeline Foundation in the room today. Um, we've got more than 40% coverage of public libraries with the eSmart Libraries program, which is a great program that enables communities to come together, to work together, to make a safe space within their, their community. We've also got the Office of the Children's eSafety Commissioner, and as we've heard, we're doing a lot of work with <coughs> libraries creating eSafe spaces. Um, this is incredibly important for us, and it's an area that we're putting a lot of investment into. We talked about the connectivity. Um, the National Broadband Network will connect with 9.5 million premises in 2018. That is the promise of government. We will see if that happens, but it's certainly going to improve connectivity through libraries. It's going to help us deliver fast broadband access. We have free Wi-Fi in 70% of public libraries, and almost all public libraries have public access terminals. 
Um, one of my great um, moments was being taken to the Northern Territory to uh, go to Antaria, or Hermansburg as it used to be called, and to be taken to the library, which was through the supermarket, round the back, past a pile of tyres, past some loos, through a commercial kitchen, and round the back of the whiteboard where they marked up what they were going to cook that day were five PC terminals. That was the library. And, you know, everywhere we go, we are realising that that's a role we have to play is providing that access. Um, 27 of 30 first-round digital hubs from the federal government were cited in public libraries. It's a real shame that programme is not continuing. Obviously, one of the problems with these federal government initiatives is that the funding runs out. One of the um, bids we're making to federal government is to say, actually, if it's a programme that has effect, that, that is good for the community, if you cite it originally in public libraries, when the federal government funding runs out, often it's so embedded as a programme that actually the local government funding will kick in and that libraries will continue to do those things. Sadly, we're all getting stretched to such a point that we're going to need some extra funding to support those things going forward. But it's a good idea to use the infrastructure that already exists and to support that rather than investing more of the original funding in creating a new infrastructure. Um, we talked about engaging content. We have 470 million items on Trove, but I did a kind of bit of maths on this, and I reckon that it was averaging 2 million new items per week. So since I wrote that, it's probably 470.5 million items on Trove. Um, we are deeply concerned, obviously, about the funding, and I'll come on to that in a minute. Um, the other thing that's going well is um, we've got some great programs in libraries. We've got Tech Savvy Seniors, we've got Everyone Connected. 66% um, of libraries, two-thirds of libraries, are offering, offering training and internet sessions. So that's going well, but where could we improve? Well, it would be great to have a little bit more of a joined-up approach to cyber safety from federal government, and I know that's being worked on and that that things are coming together. But we do find ourselves, or we have found ourselves in the past, dealing with Cyber Safety Week over here, um, a, a day over here, um, and programs over there. So it would be great to have those things joined up. Um, we would like, to, we're very pleased about the National Broadband Network, but it would be great to focus on internet speeds outside of the major metro areas. And, and particularly that last mile connection. It's one thing to have the, the National Broadband Network coming to the community, but what about that connection to the library? If you're looking to local government to pay for that, that's kind of a lost opportunity. Um, we need governments to recognise cost shifting. We need federal and state government to realise that when they've got a new programme, um, Alex talked about this earlier, when you've got a new programme that's going to be delivered and you need library staff to support people to do that. For example, libraries ACT, I know that the early childhood places are, all have to be booked online and I know that libraries ACT actually trained some staff, uh, dedicated some computer terminals and actually enabled people. Again, it was going to be the, those who were the uh, most in need of those places who would have been the most disadvantaged if libraries ACT hadn't stepped in and, and provided that support. Um, further investment by government in libraries as technology centres would be great. And we are advocating for a national framework for digital access to collections. And we desperately need Trove to be seen as a funding opportunity for a national research infrastructure um, project. Um, this isn't only about the arts, it's only a, not only a nice thing to do, it's absolutely essential for research going forward um, and for us to enable people to look back and, and assess things um, over time. Trove has that ability for us. Um, so this year is a big year for digital citizenship. Federal government, we've got the Digital Transformation Office. Um, I'm going to look forward to hearing John Cunning Cunningham later talking about digital transformation. We've got the Office of the Children's E-Safety Commissioner, and we've got the NBN rollout. Um, in terms of enterprise, Telstra's doing its Digital Inclusion Index. Um, that's going to be very exciting. We all use the Australian <coughs> Early Development Census to look at early literacy. Won't it be fantastic to have some kind of index to look at digital inclusion? And of course, this year is the national year of digital inclusion. And then we have libraries. We have the rollout of eSmart libraries. We have this glam peak bodies, galleries, libraries, archives, museums, 
all getting together to promote digital access to collections. And we have some fantastic new initiatives. Just two I'd like to mention. One is the Australian National Data Service. Um, they've launched a, a self-directed learning program. Um, it launched this month. It had uh, 900 or so people at the original first session. It is a fantastic opportunity to, to do a self-paced learning. There are some leaflets actually on the front desk. Please help yourself to one. And please talk to Karen Vizza, who's in the audience today, just sitting there. Please talk to Karen about this amazing program, which we're very pleased to support. The other thing is that there's eGov Ready Libraries, which is a Public Libraries Victoria Network and State Library of Victoria initiative to give us a self-assessment toolkit to see how ready we are for e-government in libraries. So I'd really recommend that you go online and have a look at that. I'd just like to finish um, this by, by just talking about the Australian Early Development Census and the statistics that came out um, on Monday, which was very neatly timed. To, to coincide with our National Early Literacy Summit, which several of us or many of us in the room today attended over the last two days. Um, a lot of the conversation over the last two days has been about early literacy, 0 to 5s, 0 to 8s, talking about books and print. Um, but, but we also talked about a little about digital literacy. Now, there's a few things to, to look at from the AEDC figures. I've highlighted the, the gap between the, peop the kids who are on track, about 85%, and the kids who are at risk of never developing the literacy skills they need to succeed as adults. And it's still approaching that one in five kids who, who needs our help in that area. And unfortunately, the gap between the, the kids who are on track and the kids who are um, vulnerable according to the advantaged and disadvantaged areas, is, is growing. So that is a real concern and an area where libraries can help because we operate in all those areas. Um, but what I'd also say is that the five domains, including physical, safety, health and well-being, language and, and cognitive skills, the five domains in the AEDC do not cover digital literacy. And I think it's something that the government or that the AEDC might want to consider going forward because, as we've heard, the online activity is not us as adults. It's actually affecting really very young kids now. So we really need to be thinking at this right from an early age. So thank you very much. That's my presentation and I look forward to panel discussion. Thank you.